Chapter 48, Third Year, Sirius Turns 14, Friday the 2nd of November, 1973. Remus peered around the dorm room quietly, and, finding the coast clear, crept inside. He carefully opened his trunk and shoved the package inside, covering it up with an old pair of jeans. Hiya, Mooney! A voice behind him gave Remus such a fright that he dropped the trunk lid with a heavy thunk and spun around. James was emerging from the bathroom, his dark hair wet and his glasses steamed up. Hi, he said, hoping he didn't look like he was up to anything. Are you up to something? James squinted at him. No. What are you doing? Nothing. Is it Sirius's birthday present? Remus's shoulders sagged. He sighed. Yes. You don't have to hide it from me, Mooney. James laughed, easily, throwing his towel onto the bed and beginning to get dressed. I won't tell him. Remus just shrugged awkwardly. He'd really only wanted to hide the fact that he had spent the past two hours in the fourth floor girls' loose trying to wrap the stupid thing, with moaning Myrtle cackling overhead, giving no useful advice at all. He was also trying to avoid any awkward questions about where he'd got the money. His stash of stolen cigarettes was now almost entirely depleted, and he had just about enough money left over to buy Christmas gifts for his friends and, if he was prudent, something for himself. He didn't have his heart set on anything, but Remus rather liked the idea that he could just go ahead and buy something if it caught his fancy. Lucky it's a Saturday this year, he said to James, relaxing a bit. Do you know what we're going to do? Well, obviously we'll have to sing happy birthday at breakfast, James said very seriously. Obviously, Remus agreed. And lunch and dinner. I've got Quidditch practice in the morning, but I got Hooch to let me have an extra half an hour on the pitch before the Ravenclaws go on, so we can do a bit of flying. Oh, good, Remus said, with a little less enthusiasm. It wasn't his idea of a good time to sit in the Quidditch stands alone on a cold November morning, but it was Sirius's birthday after all. Maybe he could bring a book. Then, I suppose he'll have to do that afternoon tea thing with Regulus and Narcissa, so we'll have to find out when that ends before we can sort out a proper party. Do you think the others will mind if we use the common room? Nah, Rumor shook his head with confidence. No one could deny James and Sirius anything, especially a very noisy birthday party. This was true at any given time during the year, but especially this week, when the Marauder's popularity appeared to be at its peak. Remus had hardly been able to walk down a corridor since Wednesday without hearing a cheer or getting a pat on the back from fellow Gryffindors, Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs. The Slytherins still scowled, still glared daggers if he passed them, but they couldn't say anything. A few tried, of course. For the first two days after Halloween, the occasional angelic sweetie pops or honey fluffed clinks could be heard and met with raucous laughter. Snape had even lost his temper completely during their Friday charms lesson and called James a lovely little poppet, which nearly killed Sirius with laughter and mortified Lily. The best part of this prank, which Remus hadn't even considered when he'd planned it, was that none of the Slytherins could complain to the staff about the spell, because that would mean explaining which words had been replaced. So, it was a slow and immensely enjoyable process to watch as the Slytherin students tried to figure out the counter-curse by themselves. Serves them right, Marlene giggled earlier that morning. If they were Hufflepuffs, they'd have all lifted the spell by now. Overnight, the Marauders had gone from being class clowns, well-liked and cheerfully tolerated, to heroes of the house war that had been brewing all year. Remus tried not to think about the long-term effects this might have, and focused instead on Sirius's upcoming 14th birthday. Somehow, 14 sounded even more mature than 13. You were definitely, definitely a teenager at 14. Mary sat with them at dinner that evening, yet again. Once or twice, Remus had thought about asking James how he felt about this new arrangement, but stopped himself. After all, James seemed not to care at all and carried on as usual. And Mary wasn't doing anything wrong by sitting at her own house table. Truthfully, 
Rumours had not yet been able to put his finger on why her presence bothered him so much, except that she always sat next to Sirius, which he thought was a bit of an obvious display. Sirius's continued coyness about the whole subject was just as infuriating. Rumours didn't like other people keeping secrets. "'What time will you be free tomorrow, Black?' James asked, as they tucked into crispy golden battered cod and thick-cut chips. "'What do you mean?' Sirius asked, literally splashing vinegar over his before passing the bottle to Remus. Mary, who'd been reaching for the vinegar, shot Remus a funny look. "'You know, what time will you think your black family tea will be finished? For your birthday?' "'Oh, is it your birthday, Sirius?' Mary smiled. "'You never said I would have got you something.' "'Would you?' Sirius looked at her, mildly puzzled. He turned back to James. "'I don't think the tea is happening this year. Haven't had a note.' "'Oh, really?' James raised his eyebrows, which always gave him a bit of an owlish expression. "'Are you... I mean, is that okay?' Sirius snorted, looking at his food. Why wouldn't it be? Like I give a toss. Well, great then, James grinned, shooting a look at Peter and Remus that only they would understand. We can crack on with planning you the messiest party Gryffindor Tower has ever seen. Yeah, Peter added for good measure. Am I invited? Mary asked, sitting up straighter. Obviously, Remus said, his voice more sarcastic than he'd meant it to be. Everyone's invited. Look, maybe don't make such a big fuss, Sirius said, playing with his peas. I don't feel like it much. Oh, why not? Mary cooed. It'll be fun. We'll make it as good as Remus's birthday last year. Even better. Sirius said nothing, and James threw another look at Peter and Remus. They ate the rest of their meal in almost total silence. Saturday, 3rd of November, 1973. Rumours woke up alone on the morning of Sirius's birthday, finding a note pinned to the bathroom door, written in a beautiful cursive. Gone for Quidditch practice. Knew you wouldn't want to come, so let you lie in. See you later. S. Rumours showered and then decided he may as well go to the library. He had finished his essay on Class XXX Magical Creatures and wanted to get a head start on Class 4X Creatures. He had recently learnt that he, skinny 13-year-old Remus Lupin, was classified 5X, alongside manticores and dragons. They were going ahead with the party, with or without Sirius's consent, a decision made by James and backed up by Remus. Even when he had the case of Blues, Sirius could not resist being the centre of attention and making as much noise as possible. Peter had been put in charge of decorations and, with some help from Mary and Marlene, had come up trumps, hiding a trunk full of streamers and balloons in the third year's girls' dormitory. James handled the invitations, which, as far as rumours had seen, involved shouting at various students, telling them that they'd better be there or else. Rumours was responsible for food, something which was simple enough when you had access to the map and invisibility cloak. He ate a quiet breakfast by himself with his book. Meal times were a much more peaceful affair since the Slytherins had been temporarily muzzled. Even those that had managed to break the spell were keeping their mouths shut, at least for a while. The book Remus was reading was so interesting that he couldn't put it down and instead continued to read as he meandered his way slowly towards the library occasionally sticking his hand out to avoid crashing into any pillars or doorways. So, it was completely his own fault when he bumped headlong into Regulus Black, knocking the younger boy on the floor. "'Oh, sorry,' Remus said, dropping his book and automatically offering a hand to help. Regulus glared at him, and narrowed his eyes at the scars crisscrossing Remus's wrists. He climbed to his feet unassisted, brushing himself off, sniffing at Remus, with his inherited black dignity. "'Watch where you're going,' he said icily. "'I said sorry,' Remus replied, a bit annoyed. He didn't want to start anything. He just wanted to get to the library without any trouble. "'What are you doing wandering about alone, anyway?' Regulus asked, suspiciously. "'Planning some other hilarious assault on our freedom of speech.' Remus scoffed. 
I could ask you the same thing. Where's that creepy little crouch kid? Anyway, you can't prove we did anything. No. Regulus's lips curled. But I know my brother was involved. Oh yeah? Yes. I didn't get the same words as everyone else. Hmm. Remus tried to look unconcerned by this, but he'd had no idea that Sirius had cursed his brother differently. Every time I try to say my house's name, it comes out. Regulus glanced fervently about himself, as if afraid he might be overheard. Go, Gryffindor, go! Remus burst out laughing, under Regulus's imperious glare. Sorry, Remus said for the third time. It's, well, it, it is quite funny. Of course you think it's funny, the younger boy sniffed. He was shorter than Remus, but somehow still managed to look down his nose at him. You, your kind can't possibly understand what my brother is putting at stake. I've done my best to hide the worst of it from our parents, but he has to keep pushing. So, is that why he's not invited to your stupid Nancy tea party? Remus asked, angry on his friend's behalf. Narcissa didn't think it was worth it this year. Regulus's cold stare faltered, and he looked away. Remus had the impression that Regulus would have quite liked the chance to see his brother. And this latest joke of his has just proved it. He's never going to, to come back. Regulus shook himself and turned in the direction of the dungeons. Remus felt a surge of sympathy and against his better judgment called him back. Reg, wait! Regulus turned, looking horrified by Remus's over-familiarity. But Regulus was such an ugly mouthful of a name. Worse than Remus by a mile. Look, he hurried. We're having a party for Sirius in the common room tonight. You can come if you don't, Regulus said sharply, looking anxious. Don't invite me, okay? Just leave it. Tell him happy birthday for me. He hurried away. With or without Regulus, the party was a roaring success. Quite literally. Every lion motif in the common room, and there were quite a few, had been enchanted to roar every time anyone said the words birthday or serious. The whole of Gryffindor House got involved, and Remus was pretty sure that some of the other older students were passing round flasks of something a bit stronger than the butterbeer everyone else was drinking. Sirius's record player was spinning wildly at double time, and lots of the girls had got up to dance. Mary tried to haul Sirius up for... John, I'm only dancing. But he shook his head fervently and stayed on the couch with Remus and Peter. I only know the waltz, he confided to them in a whisper. And I'll be fucked if I ever do that again. James did get up and try to shake his hips as close to Lily as possible, but quickly tripped over a ruck in the rug and nearly went headlong into the fireplace. Sirius laughed heartily at this and Remus was pleased to see that at least he wasn't letting his family get to him today. He decided not to tell Sirius about his encounter with Regulus just yet. It wouldn't make him any happier, so what was the point? You're Lupin, aren't you? A girl leaned over the back of the sofa, her long black hair brushing Remus's shoulder. He'd seen her before. She was a six-year. Um, yeah? He nodded, jumping up. My friend, Faria. Says you're selling, uh, come over here. He jumped in, jerking his head wildly. He'd so far managed to conduct his business privately and without the other marauders knowing. What do you want? He asked, once they were in the furthest corner away from Sirius and Peter. Two packs of whatever you've got, she said. A galleon. What? She exclaimed. But Faria said it was five sickles a pack. I'm running low on stock. Remus said, disinterested. Supply and demand. Ugh, fine. She folded her arms and tossed her head. A galleon. Can't get them now. Meet me here at seven tomorrow. A.M. On a Sunday? I have plenty of customers, you know. All right, all right. What's going on there, Mooney? Sirius eyed him as Remus returned to the couch. His suspicious look was identical to his brother's. Not another girlfriend. Shut up. Remus kicked him. Who's your girlfriend, Remus? 
Mary sat up, looking interested. God, Remus thought, where did she come from? I don't have a girlfriend, Black's just being a dick. Good. Mary settled down, smiling smugly. Because if you did, she twirled her corkscrew hair around one finger. I know someone who'd be really disappointed. Ah, okay, he replied, trying not to show her how annoyed he was. Who fancies Mooney? Sirius asked, nudging Mary. I couldn't possibly tell you, Mary replied, mimicking buttoning her lips. Remus wished she'd do that for real, for good. Girls, Sirius said with exasperation. Nightmares, the bloody lot of you. Mary mock-pouted but said nothing more. Sirius shook his head at her, but he was smiling. Finally, he returned to Remus. So, what are you selling? That girl said you were selling something. Nope, Remus said innocently. She had the wrong person. I'll work it out, you know, Sirius said, a look of glee in his deep blue eyes. Not that I'm not grateful for the truly excellent birthday present. He nodded at the floor, where his recently unpacked Zonko's Deluxe Practical Joke Kit lay proudly proclaiming, sure to complete the collection of any master prankster. But I'm going to figure out how you paid for it, eventually. I don't believe this stuff about a dead aunt leaving you money. Your dead uncle left you money, Remus countered. Can't touch it till I'm of age, though, can I? Sirius said shrewdly. Nope, you're up to something, Lupin. I know you. You're not moony if you don't have a secret. So let me have my secret, then. Remus turned his head mysteriously. Chapter 49, Third Year Know Thyself Sunday the 11th of November, 1973 Remus fell awake, spluttering and shivering. The room was gloomy, and his breath blew out in white plumes above his head. Everything hurt. He raised his hands in front of his face, and found his fingertips blue and bloody. There were splinters under his nails, and more blood somewhere else. He could smell it, but he couldn't see very well in the dark, and he didn't have the energy to lift his head. His bones felt like they were made of chalk. He was so, so tired. Still, if there was as much blood as he thought, it probably wasn't a good idea to sleep. He ought to stay awake at least until Madame Pomfrey could arrive, which shouldn't be long. Remus lay still and focused on his breathing. There was a Gryffindor game on today as well, another thing he'd been missing. Not only that, but his friends would be too busy to visit. He turned his head and heaved. He hoped he wouldn't be sick. It was so embarrassing to be sick. He didn't have his wand with him, so he couldn't clean it up. Good morning, Remus. Madame Pomfrey finally entered the room. Oh dear, bit of a mess, huh? He raised his head and promptly threw up. I'm not sure I like all this reading you do, Madame Pomfrey tutted as she brought him a healing draught. I know your studies are important to you, but you need to rest. I slept all morning, he replied, and I get so bored otherwise. Do you know how the Quidditch match went? I'm afraid I don't, the Medi-Witch smiled. I'm sure Mr. Potter will be up here to tell you as soon as he can, though. That wasn't very likely. If they'd won, there would be a victory party, and Remus had made James promise not to miss it on his account. He accepted the potion he was given, and swallowed it all without complaint. It was bitter, but he'd grown used to it now. He had to read, because if he didn't, he would have nothing to do at all, except think about his fresh scars. This month, the wolf had torn at his torso, which was better than his arms or face. At least he could hide the marks easily. Remus rarely undressed in front of anyone. Even once the marauders had found out about his little furry problem, no one but Madame Pomfrey had seen the true extent of the damage. Well, Sirius had once, early in second year, but neither of them had since acknowledged that strange encounter. Still, Remus wasn't naive, and he knew that one day, however far away it might be, someone would expect him to take his top off, at the very least. It didn't bear thinking about. Perhaps he'd just have to avoid girls forever. Mr. Lupin, 
A cheerful voice boomed across the hospital floor, making Remus jump. It was Professor Ferox, holding two large jars of clear liquid in his arms. Oh, hello. Remus gave a small wave. Mert lap essence, as promised, Poppy. The professor set down the jars. Don't come over, don't come over. Remus thought frantically as Professor Ferox strode across the room towards his bed. Been in the wars, our kid? He asked kindly. Um, Remus wanted to shrink and hide under the bedsheets. He hated the thought of strong, energetic Ferox seeing him in his weakened state. I'm okay. Ferox sat down beside Remus's bed. Remus resigned himself to his fate. Second time here this year, huh? The professor said, looking concerned. Remus nodded, even though it was his third moon this term. If Ferox hadn't noticed one absence, then perhaps he wouldn't connect the dots. You know, if you need more time for your homework, you only need to ask. I've never handed anything in late, Remus protested. No, Ferox's eyes twinkled. You certainly haven't. His eyes moved to the bandages poking out of Remus's pyjama vest, covering a new cut that snaked up his collarbone. Something registered in the older man's eyes, and Remus knew almost instinctively that Ferox knew. I can do anything anyone else can, Remus said, looking his teacher in the eye. I can see that. Ferox now eyed the pile of books on the bedside table. These all for school? Some of them. Remus replied, Some of them are for fun. I like finding out new stuff. I like knowing stuff. Yes, I can tell that from your essays. Ferox was smiling again, which made Remus relax a bit. Do you fancy a career caring for magical creatures? Or maybe something more like your father? Uh, I hadn't thought about it. Remus lied. Ferox laughed. He tapped the book at the top of the pile. It was borrowed from Sirius. A muggle philosophy book. Know thyself, Remus, Ferox said. Plato, Remus said quickly. Ferox laughed again, standing up. Exactly. He ruffled Remus's hair before turning to leave. I hope you feel better soon, Lupin. See you on Wednesday. It was all very cryptic, Remus thought, realising he'd been holding his breath for almost a minute since Ferox left the room. He hadn't started the Plato yet, only skimmed it. It wasn't the sort of thing he usually was interested in, but he'd committed to try a bit of everything. Secretly, he wanted to be able to show off to Sirius that he'd read more books. Sirius hardly spent any time reading any more. His single-minded mission to fulfil his role as the black family black sheep meant that he had little time for anything else other than causing trouble. He'd regret that one day, in Remus's opinion. Remus had seen plenty of boys at St Edmunds trying to push their limits like that. The problem was, some limits weren't fences. Sometimes they were edges, with nothing on the other side. He healed pretty well, despite the brutal scarring, and Madame Pomfrey sent him back to Gryffindor Tower that evening, with the understanding that he did nothing but rest. He walked slowly, as promised. When he finally reached the common room, he did not find the victory party he'd expected, but a rather subdued atmosphere, and the marauders were nowhere to be seen. Remus furrowed his brow and headed up the stairs to find his room also empty. Puzzled, he went back downstairs. Marlene and Mary were playing snap at the fireplace. Hiya, he went over. All right, Remus, where have you been? Mary asked, not looking up from her cards. Been sick. Stomach bug. How's the game? We lost, Marlene sighed. James was bloody brilliant, as usual, and I must have blocked at least twenty bludgers. But Ramsay caught the snitch right at the wrong time. Ah, sorry, McKinnon. Remus rubbed the back of his head. That was odd. If they'd lost, and there had been no party, then why hadn't the others come to see him? He tried to ignore the stabbing feeling in his stomach. You seen James? Or Sirius? Or anyone? Nope, the girl said in unison. Marlene slammed down a card, then winced as it blew up. She looked up. Want to play? Uh, nah. 
Still feel a bit funny. Gonna go lie down. Thanks, though. He trudged back upstairs, feeling an uncomfortable mix of anxiety and anger. He'd said they shouldn't put off celebrating just for him, but that didn't mean he didn't want to see them at all. They didn't have to leave him on his own like that, without so much checking to see if he was okay. For all they knew, he could be in the infirmary still, at death's door, with no one but Madame Pomfrey for company. Were they bored of the whole thing? Was it less exciting now? Was he less exciting? Remus lay on his bed, on top of the covers. He felt like he'd only been out of pyjamas for an hour. He didn't want to get back into them, no matter how tired he was. He considered reading, but he didn't have the energy. He could listen to a record, but that would mean getting up. In the end, he stayed put, lying in the dark with the curtains drawn. At St Edmund's, before he could read, before he had magic, or friends, Remus had grown used to boredom. He would make up stories in his head, run through song lyrics he'd memorised, or try to come up with the longest words he'd ever heard. Now, as he waited for sleep to come, Remus pondered on what Ferox had said to him earlier. Know thyself. He couldn't remember the context for Plato having said that. It had to mean, know who you are. Remus knew all about his friends. He knew that James was a natural leader, a Quidditch god who would do anything for anyone. Remus knew that even though they all teased James for being infatuated with Lily, James had a clearer understanding of love than anyone, and if he said he was going to marry her one day, then he probably would. Remus knew that Peter was ashamed of his family, especially his older sister, who he'd once looked up to, and that fitting in meant more to him than anything else in the world. Remus knew that Mary's parents were born in Jamaica, and that she was the only witch in a family of seven, and that she never had ever even cried, even when she was furious. He knew that Lily cried every time she got a letter from home, and that she wrote to her sister every week, and hadn't once received a response. He knew that Marlene didn't get on very well with her dad, who was a muggle, and who drank too much. Then there was Sirius. But it took nothing special to know Sirius. He thought he was aloof and mysterious, but the truth was that Black wore his heart on his sleeve, and kept nothing back. He felt everything so strongly, and his happiness was as chaotic as his misery. Sometimes you had to take a step back, in case you got dragged under his wheels. Who was Remus then? An orphan, but not quite. A wizard, but only half-blood. A monster, but not every day. What else was there? No need to flesh out supporting characters too much. Mooney? The whisper filled the room as loud as the klaxon. Remus did not reply. He was too grumpy. The door opened, and three sets of footsteps entered. Even with the bed curtains drawn, Remus knew it was James who approached first. Psst! Mooney! He's sleeping, mate! He sighed, rolling over. No. The curtains were pulled aside. Remus sat up to make room as James, then Sirius, then Peter, crawled inside to sit with him. We went to the hospital wing, but she said you'd gone already, James explained. Came up after dinner. Where were you? Library. How was it? Sirius asked. The full moon and everything. Okay. He gave the same answer every month. It wasn't... I mean, you weren't cut up too much? Peter asked, wringing his hands. A bit. Remus nodded. Not too bad. What were you doing in the library? That's what we wanted to talk to you about. Sirius burst out. Obviously he was dying to say something, and Remus felt the last of his irritation melt away as his curiosity peaked. Sirius, James said, in the voice he used to temper his friends. He looked at Remus. We were doing some research, and it's sort of about you. Sort of, Sirius scoffed. It's all about you, Mooney. I've wanted to tell you since last term... But James wouldn't. I just wanted to make sure we could do it. James elbowed Sirius. Stop interrupting me, bloody hell. Remus, the thing is, ever since we found out about, um, your little furry problem, 
We wanted to do something to help. There's no cure, Remus replied quickly. He didn't like the sound of this. He felt horribly self-conscious as they all stared at him with the same mad look in their eyes. No, no, we know that, James waved his hand. But we thought there must be something we could do to make you stop hurting yourself, you know. We found out that normal werewolves don't do that, Peter said, eager to have his own say. So we- Normal? Remus asked, alarmed. Not normal, Sirius kicked Peter. Others. Others like you, who don't get locked up during the moon. Right. So you're probably doing it to yourself because you're trapped and frustrated. Well, yeah, I knew that. Remus drew his knees up to his chest, an inch back a bit. He wished they weren't all on his bed. They were much too close. He could smell their blood. He could hear it rushing in their veins. But we thought if you had company... Obviously not human company, James explained hurriedly. Everything we've read said that if you get near to a human, then you're a goner. But animals, Sirius exploded. Other animals would probably be fine. His eyes shone with excitement, and Remus wished he could return it. He was too distracted to be able to follow what they were saying. So what? I need a pet. James laughed. Sort of, but we thought we could be the animals. Remus stared at him. He looked at each of his friends in turn. They were all barking mad. You're going to be animals, he said flatly. Like McGonagall, Peter squeaked. Like, but she's an animagus. You have to study and train and get registered and you can't even start until you're 17. Mooney, Mooney, Mooney. Sirius shook his head infuriatingly. We're marauders. We don't need to bother with all of that. Even if you wanted to break the law, Remus caught James's eye on that point to confirm that this was definitely what they were talking about. This isn't some school prank. It's serious magic, one of the hardest things to do. That's why we're telling you about it, Sirius said. I wanted it all to be a surprise, but James reminded us that, well... It is bloody hard, so the more help we get, the better. You really think you can do it, don't you? Remus frowned. If you help us, James nodded. We're the best students in the year, except for Evans. Don't see why we shouldn't try. What if it goes wrong? Remus chewed his lip. What if I still... After I transform? What if I can tell you're not really animals? What if I go for you anyway? We'll test it. We'll test it over and over until we know it's safe, Sirius said. It's so risky. I know! Black's eyes were practically blazing in his head now, and Remus knew there was no point trying to be reasonable. He took a deep breath. Let me think about it, please. He appealed to James. Don't do anything yet. Just give me a few days. Okay. James nodded. That's fair. Just think, Mooney, Sirius grinned, as if he hadn't heard them. Once we've done this, there's nothing we can't do. We'll be unstoppable. Chapter 50. Third Year. Philomena Pettigrew. Friday, 21st of December, 1973. Once he was finally given the space to think about it, Remus wondered why he'd ever even asked for more time. Of course he would say yes. He didn't think he'd ever say no to his friends, even if it made him nervous. And it did make him nervous. Perhaps it was their excitement that worried him, or their overconfidence. He knew that part of their eagerness had to do with the plan being incredibly illegal, dangerous and reckless. But they were also doing it for him. He wasn't sure how to feel about that yet. Better not to think about it. He took James aside one day not long after they'd proposed the idea and asked for all of the research they had so far. It was promptly presented to him in a huge bundle of parchment, reams and reams of notes and diagrams penned in a familiar neat cursive script. To say that they had been thorough was an understatement. If only Sirius paid that much attention to writing his essays, 
Remus would never have a hope of beating him to top of the class. They had left no stone unturned. They had charted the full moons for the next decade at least. They had practically written an entire history of European lycanthropy, along with feeding habits and migration patterns, pack behaviour, canine communication signals. They had listed every ingredient they would need, its costs and availability. Every ritual was carefully transcribed, step by step, and the incantation spelled out phonetically. There were timelines, suggested locations for certain aspects of the extensive process. Everything was painstakingly detailed. Christ, Remus said, when he'd finished reading it. You've done all of this? It was mostly serious, James grinned. Actually, basically all of it was serious. He did most of it over the summer holidays, while he was bored. A real labour of love. Remus's stomach flipped. He didn't know what to say. How could he refuse them after all of that? Suddenly, selling stolen cigarettes to underage wizards seemed very tame indeed. It was agreed that work would begin in earnest over the Christmas holidays, when they would all be away from Hogwarts. Remus had secured permission for Matron, McGonagall and Madame Pomfrey to spend the break with the Potters, and as always, Peter was only up the road. Sirius was in a dark mood as term drew to a close, until he received a very short note during breakfast one morning. To Master S. O. Black III. You will not be required at the family home this winter break. Do as you please. Signed, Orion Black. Yes! James cheered, almost knocking over his porridge. Might even get you for the summer at this rate. What about Regulus? Remus asked, tentatively, quietly, in case Sirius wanted to pretend he hadn't heard. Oh, little Prince Reg is going home for Christmas, Sirius replied, shoving the note into his pocket. It's just me they've disinvited. Good, perfect, excellent. They don't care, I don't care. He didn't properly cheer up until they were all packing. Sirius covertly showed Remus the gifts he had brought for Mr. and Mrs. Peter. A beautiful golden watch chain and a pretty garnet brooch. Do you think they're okay? he asked nervously. My family's shit at doing presents, so I never really know. Black. Sirius, they're... I mean, they're perfect. Don't worry. Remus felt a sinking feeling as he thought about the slightly shabby box of mid-range biscuits he'd bought for his hosts. He couldn't be helped now. He had done his best. Remus was actually looking forward to Christmas this year, and for what may have been the very first time. He was still a bit shy about spending time in someone else's house, but now that he knew how the potters were, he relaxed into the idea. He had sold the very last of his illicit cigarettes at a premium, and bought presents for everyone he could, even Lily, Mary and Marlene. It was a real pleasure giving people presents, he realised. Maybe even better than getting them. In addition, despite some reservations, Remus was excited about beginning the Animagus process. It would be some of the most complex magic they had performed yet. He had asked McGonagall about it, as subtly as possible. She had praised him for taking an interest, but said that it was well above third year standard, or even seventh year. He relished the thought of proving her wrong. There was one other thing that he was hoping to get out of the break, something he hadn't mentioned to the others, because it was private. Last year, at the Potter's Christmas party, Remus had been accosted by an old man who knew a lot about Lyle Lupin. At the time, Remus had been struck mute by the revelation and shock of it. But now, a year older and feeling quite mature at the grand old age of 13, Remus hoped he might learn a bit more. Sunday, the 22nd of December, 1973. The full moon had fallen earlier in the month this year, so all former orders were able to join their peers aboard the Hogwarts Express on the usual Saturday. In a change from their usual train journey, Marlene and Mary joined the boys in their carriage. Remus suspected that Lily was somewhere on her own with Severus, probably listening to him whinge about how nobody liked him, 
Did you get your essay back off Ferox? Marlene asked Remus, a deep crease in her brow. I only barely got an acceptable mark, and my mum's going to go mental if I don't get better results this year. Yeah, I did okay, Remus replied, embarrassed by his third outstanding that term. We'll bring back the study club after Christmas, right? Mary put in. Lily's up for it. Don't worry, Miles, you'll be fine. Sounds good, Remus nodded. Mooney's joined a club without us, Sirius wailed, pretending to weep on James's shoulder. He's a big boy now, James patted his friend solemnly. They grow up so fast. Piss off, Remus grinned. They have slug club for poshos like you. You can study with us if you want, Sirius, Mary purred. Sirius looked alarmed. He used the library exclusively as a resource for jinx and hexes, not for doing anything as mundane as homework. Mary didn't know Sirius. Not really. When they pulled into King's Cross, Remus felt a certain thrill when he saw that Mr and Mrs Potter were there to collect all of them. Usually, he had to cross the barrier and go looking for Matron in the cafe or by the newspaper stand. He was in for a shock, however, when he learnt that he was about to apparate for the first time. Hold my arm, dear. Mrs Potter smiled kindly at him. Close your eyes, it'll all be over in a moment. Remus obeyed, scrunching his eyes shut. It was much worse than flu powder. Worse than flying. He nearly dragged Mrs Potter down with him when they landed, as he lost his balance and fell hard on the pavement outside the Potter's house. Whoopsie daisy. Mrs Potter laughed kindly, pulling him up again. You're all right now. She brushed his knees and shoulders. Now, I'll just pop back for Sirius. Monty will be over with James in two ticks. And with a crack, she vanished. Remus barely had any time to lean on the low front gate and catch his breath before there was another crack. And Mr Potter appeared with James, who didn't look half as bad as Remus felt. Once they were all there, Mrs Potter ushered them all into the house, sending their trunks flying up the stairs to their respective rooms, boiling a kettle and slicing some homemade Madeira cake in all what felt like a few seconds. As Remus sat at the Potter's big wooden kitchen table, eating cake and sipping a huge mug of tea, listening to James and Sirius chatter nineteen to the dozen about the term so far, he couldn't resist sighing contentedly to himself. Two whole weeks of this. Unfortunately, unlike the previous year, there had been no snow yet this winter, only rain. In fact, as the evening drew on, the downpour grew heavier and heavier until thunder cracked open the sky and hailstones battered the window panes. Rather than go outside, the boys sat in the living room under the Christmas tree, playing games and tossing the occasional tea cake onto the fire. Remus himself settled into a book on human transfiguration, and Mrs Potter reviewed her lists for the coming celebrations. We've a few more people coming this year, she explained, as the long thin strips of parchment hovered before her, a royal blue quill working quickly across the surface, ticking off various items. Some friends from the old days, and some newer acquaintances. As she said this, she glanced fervently over at Sirius who wasn't paying attention, immersed in the game. Only just have enough room for all of you, she continued, with a happy smile that was just like her son's. Just then, there was a knock at the door. Sirius sat bolt upright, as if he'd been struck by lightning. He turned to Mrs Potter, wide-eyed. It wasn't his mother. Remus knew this, but he didn't say so, because how on earth would that sound? Don't worry, Sirius, I know your mother's scent. Too bloody creepy. Mrs Potter got up, leaving the lists hovering in midair, and went to answer the door. A cold breeze blew in, and the three boys listened intently. It was a woman, but her voice was higher and younger than that of Walperga Black. She sounded as though she was crying, and Mrs Potter spoke in soothing tones. Boys, she called from the hallway. They got up and went to meet her. She was standing just inside the kitchen doorway. Behind her, a young woman with long blonde hair sat at the table, 
her head in her hands. "'What's up, Mum?' James asked, craning his neck. "'It's getting late. You'd all better go to bed. Philly's staying the night, and I'm afraid we've no room left. Sirius, would you mind sharing with James tonight, dear?' We can all share, James said generously. Everyone else is arriving tomorrow anyway. Might as well just all bunk up together. Mrs Potter nodded and summoned the house elf. James's bedroom was absolutely perfect in every way. Huge and spacious. The walls were plastered with Gryffindor banners and Quidditch posters. Every broom he'd ever owned was mounted on the wall and his shelves were packed with wizard children's books and old toys that he clearly wasn't ready to let go of just yet. Chief, among all of these, were little knight figurines, apparently supposed to be Godric Gryffindor himself, marching back and forth along the edge of the bookcase. The bed was huge, hung with red velvet drapes, the same as their dorm room, and though it was big enough for all three of them, the house elf had whipped up two single beds which lay at the foot of it. Who was that? Remus asked, as they all sat on the big bed together in their pyjamas. Philomena, James said, Pete's sister. What's she doing here? I think she's been arguing with Pete's folk. They don't like her going to Muggle University, and... He lowered his voice. Dad said she's got a Muggle boyfriend. Really? Sirius's eyes widened in awe. Remus said nothing. He hadn't known that going out with muggles was particularly taboo. Yeah, and you know what mum's like, James nudged Sirius. Loves taking in strays. Christmas Eve, 1973. Philomena was present at breakfast the next morning and remained for the whole of Christmas. At first, she didn't say very much, but stared into space, pale-faced and red-eyed. From what Remus had gathered... Going out with a muggle was not only taboo, but an offence worthy of disowning your own child. Apart from the Potters, Remus couldn't help but think that wizards did not make very good parents, based on his experience. Pete's sister was about seven years older than him, and you might not know that they were related at all, other than their straw-coloured hair. Where Pete was round and podgy, Philomena was slim and dainty-featured. She had chocolate brown eyes and a delicate smattering of pale brown freckles all over her little nose. Her hair was worn in the same style as many muggle girls Remus had seen, long and poker straight with a thick parted fringe, like Marion Faithful. James, who knew her best, could not do enough for the pretty visitor. He offered her tea, held out her chair and generally became her willing servant, until even Sirius had had enough of him. Bloody hell, Potter, she's just a girl. I'm being nice, James frowned. Nothing wrong with being nice to my mate's sister. They hadn't seen Peter. Once Mrs Pettigrew learnt where her daughter was staying, he had been confined to the house. They were making do by sending owls back and forth, which was probably more fun for James and Sirius than it was for Peter. What would Evans say? Sirius teased James, who turned bright red. She'd be glad someone's taken his mind of her, Rima suggested from where he was lounging on the camp bed. You can talk, Black, James shoved his friend. What's going on between you and Mary? MacDonald? Sirius asked innocently. Dunno what you're talking about. Oh, come on, James groaned. Tell us. Have you snogged her or what? Remus dropped his book. Snogging? Since when was snogging on the cards? Sirius gave a coy look. No. Kissed her cheek, though. Oh, how scandalous, Black. James threw a pillow at him. Sirius threw it back, and all of a sudden they were wrestling. Remus usually just rolled his eyes and let them get on with it. But now he used the distraction to gather his thoughts. He felt very childish and silly, not having realised that Sirius liked Mary back, that there was kissing involved now. Even if it was just a peck on the cheek, Remus racked his brains, trying to put himself in Sirius's position. If a girl liked you, 
you pretty much had to kiss them. Wasn't that the case? Was it awful if a girl didn't like you? If Sirius now liked Mary and James liked Lily, ought he to pick a girl too? Marlene was okay. A bit shy, like him. Maybe Marlene then. The thought kept him up that night, long after James and Sirius had fallen asleep. They both slept in James's bed. Sirius had simply climbed in on the first night, and James hadn't said a word. Rumours kept to himself, on his designated camp bed. He tried to take his mind off it, think about Christmas and stockings and crackers, but it was all in vain. All he could think about was Sirius kissing Mary's cheek. And where had they done it? When had it been? What did it feel like? Eventually, restless and overwrought, he got up to get some water. He padded out of the room, into the bathroom across the hall, and ran the tap. He sipped some of the tepid water, and looked at himself in the mirror. In the dim light, he couldn't see his scars. Would a girl ever like him, if he looked the way he looked? He would never be as good-looking as Sirius, or even James, but perhaps he was slightly better than Peter. How on earth would you know? Suddenly, the lights flashed on, burning his retinas so that he almost dropped his glass. Oh, sorry. Philomena stood in the doorway, in a long, peachy-coloured nightie. She looked shocked. What are you doing wandering around in the dark? Um, I have really good eyesight, he mumbled, stepping away from the sink. I couldn't sleep. Me neither, she sighed. Once the surprise had left her face, she looked sad again. Rumours hoped she wouldn't cry. He was useless with crying. Oh God, if he got a girlfriend, would he have to deal with crying? He had no time to swallow back his panic before Philomena started talking again. It's horrible to be away from family at Christmas, isn't it? Uh, I grew up in a children's home, actually. Oh really? She looked interested for a moment. You're one of Peter's little friends, aren't you? I didn't know he knew any Muggleborns. Kept that quiet from Mummy. My dad was a wizard, Rumour said with some confidence. Be died. Half blood, she murmured. But even so, she trailed off despondently. Rumour shifted uncomfortably. His bare feet were beginning to get cold on the bathroom tiles, and he was only wearing his underwear and a vest to sleep in, which was embarrassing enough. She didn't seem to mind. You're lucky, she said, not having to grow up with all of this shit. You mean magic? Remus frowned. He'd never heard a witch or wizard, pure blood or muggleborn, talk this way. Yeah, magic, she sniffed. What's so bloody good about magic? What makes us so special? Do you want to know a secret? He didn't, but he thought it'd be better not to say so. She carried on anyway, whispering now. I wish I was a muggle sometimes, she said, a glimmer of madness in her eye. If I could do it, I'd run away forever and never be found, and I'd have a nice normal job and a nice normal life, and I'd fall in love with whoever I want. At this last affirmation, she burst into tears. You you could do that anyway, if you wanted, Rumour said quickly, not sure exactly why he was saying what he was saying. She looked at him suspiciously. What do you mean? Well, what's stopping you? He asked. You're of age. You can do whatever you like. Go and be a waitress. Or run away to America and be a film star. Marry Prince Charles if you want to. I mean, you might need to use a bit of magic to get started. But you give it up. No one says you have to do magic. She stared at him and looked him up and down. No one's ever said that to me before. Remus shrugged. What's your name again? Remus. Remus Lupin. Oh, she burst out laughing. You poor thing. That's almost as bad as Philomena. End of chapter 50